In this lecture, we will be learning about the threats to biodiversity. While there are obvious natural threats to biodiversity, such as hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, asteroid strikes, or major climactic events, perhaps the most significant threat to biodiversity on the planet today is actually human being. Yes. What would geologic time? The fate of virtually every species is extinction. Extension is the elimination of a species from the planet, such as happened with the dodo bird, the American passenger pigeon, and even the Neanderthals. Throughout geologic time, extinction events are actually quite common. The fossil record suggests that more than 99% of all species that ever existed are now extinct. Periodic mass extinctions have wiped out entire species and families of organisms. <clears throat> This slide shows what we believe to be major mass extinctions events throughout geologic history. On average, we lose about five to seven families per million years. However, during mass extinction events, we can lose upwards of 20 families per million years. As you can see from this figure, extinction events have multiple causes, such as glaciation, climate change, or meteorite, meteorite events. However, data now suggests that we may be in a sixth mass extinction caused by human activities. In fact, because of the dominance of man, 30 of the 35 members of the Anthropocene Working Group of the International Commission on Stratigraphy's Subcommission on Quaternary Stratigraphy recently voted to create a new geologic age, the Anthropocene. This new geologic age is a term widely used to define the current period of dramatic human influence changes to the Earth. The working group voted that the Anthropocene should be formally recognized as a new geologic time interval. Anthropocene working group members recently voted to pin the start of the Anthropocene in the 1950s when atmospheric nuclear bomb blasts deposited radioactive plutonium in sediment layers. Pictured here is the Ivy Mike nuclear test conducted in 1952 by the United States. <clears throat> the rate at which species are disappearing has increased dramatically over the past 150 years. Between AD 1600 and 1850, human activities appear to have eliminated two or three species per decade, about double the natural extinction rate. In the past 150 years, the extinction rate has increased to thousands per decade. Conservation biologists call this the sixth mass extinction, but note that this time it's not asteroids or volcanoes, but human impacts that are responsible. E.O. Wilson summarizes human threats to biodiversity with the acronym HIPPO, which stands for Habitat Destruction, Invasive Species, Pollution, Population of Humans, and Overharvesting. Let's look in more detail at each of these issues. The most important extinction threat for most species, especially terrestrial ones, is habitat loss. Perhaps the most obvious example of habitat destruction is conversion of forests and grasslands to farmland. Over the past 10,000 years, humans have transformed billions of hectares of former forests and grasslands to croplands, cities, roads, and other uses. These human-dominated spaces aren't devoid of wild organisms, but they generally favor weedy species adapted to coexist with us. Sometimes, we destroy habitat as a side effect of resource extraction, such as mining, dam building, and indiscriminate fishing methods. Surface mining, for example, strips off the land covering along with everything growing on it. Waste from mining operations can bury valleys and poison streams with toxic material. Dam building floods vital stream habitat under deep reservoirs and eliminates food sources and breeding habitat for some aquatic species. Our current fishing methods are highly unsustainable. One of the most destructive fishing techniques is bottom trawling, in which heavy nets are dragged across the ocean floor scooping up every living thing and crushing the bottom structure to lifeless rubble. Marine biologist Jan Lubachenko says that trawling is like collecting forest mushrooms with a bulldozer. 
This series of maps shows the level of habitat destruction associated with the conversion of forests to agricultural and residential land uses. Here we see the decrease in wooded areas of Kedes Township in southern Wisconsin during European settlement. The green areas represent the amount of land in forest each year. As you can see, over a 120-year period, the entire forest ecosystem has been converted, resulting in habitat loss for thousands of species. In addition to the loss of total habitat area, the loss of large contiguous areas is a serious problem. A general term for this is habitat fragmentation, the reduction of habitat into small, isolated patches. Breaking up habitat reduces biodiversity because many species, such as bears and large cats, require large territories to subsist. Other species, such as forest interior birds, reproduce successfully only in deep forest far from edges and human settlement. Predators and invasive species often spread quickly into new regions following fragment edges. Fragmentation also divides populations into isolated groups, making them much more vulnerable to catastrophic events such as storms or diseases. A very small population may not have enough breeding adults to be viable even under normal circumstances. An important question in conservation biology is, what is the minimum viable population size for a species and when dwindling populations have grown too small to survive? A major threat to native biodiversity in many places is from accidentally or deliberately introduced species. Called a variety of names, alien, exotic, non-native, non-indigenous, pests, Invasive species are organisms that thrive in new territory where they are free of predators, diseases, or resource limitations that may have controlled their population in their native habitat. Humans have always transported organisms into new habitats, but the rate of movement has risen sharply in recent years with the huge increase in speed and volume of travel by air, water, and land. Some species are deliberately released because people believe they will be aesthetically pleasing or economically beneficial. Some of the worst are pets released to the wild when owners tire of them. Many hitch a ride and ship ballast water in the wood of packing crates, inside suitcases or shipping containers, or in the soil of potted plants. Sometimes we introduce invasive species into new habitats thinking that we're being kind and compassionate without being aware of the ecological consequences. The introduction of invasive species, particularly predators, into island environments is especially destructive as the native species often have evolved without predators. This figure shows some of the most widespread invasive species now affecting North America. Kudzu vine, which grows at a rapid rate, was introduced to the American South in order to prevent erosion in the clay soils and along roadways. This species grows so quickly that it can overtake forests and cover buildings in a single summer. The zebra mussel, invasive species in the Great Lakes, <coughs> takes up residence in water intake pipes, creating a foul taste in drinking water extracted from Lake Erie. <coughs> Florida has many invasive species, both plant and animal, because they are often imported from Asia or South America. This photograph shows the invasive leafy spurge, which blankets a formerly diverse pasture. Introduced accidentally and inedible for most herbivores, this plant costs hundreds of millions of dollars each year in lost grazing value and in weed control. This graph shows the extinction rates for birds in the Channel Islands off the coast of Southern California as a function of population size. Small population size is often a precursor to extinction. Pollution is another human-based cause of biodiversity loss. We have long known that toxic pollutants can have disastrous effects on local populations of organisms. The links between pesticides and the declines of fish-eating birds were well documented in the 1970s. 
population declines are especially likely in species high in the food chain, such as marine mammals, alligators, fish, and fish-eating birds. Mysterious, widespread deaths of thousands of Arctic seals are thought to be linked to an accumulation of persistent chlorinated hydrocarbons, such as DDT, PCBs, and dioxins in the food chain. These chemicals accumulate in fat and cause weakened immune systems. Bald eagles and other bird species at the top of the food chain were decimated by DDT in the 1960s. Many such species have recovered since DDT was banned in the United States and because of protections under the Endangered Species Act. Lead poisoning is another major cause of mortality for many species of wildlife. Bottom-feeding waterfowl, such as ducks, swans, and cranes, ingest spent shotgun pellets that fall into lakes and marshes. They store the pellets instead of stones in their gizzards, and the lead slowly accumulates in their blood and other tissues. The United States Fish and Wildlife Service estimates that 3,000 metric tons of lead shot are deposited annually in wetlands and that between 2 and 3 million waterfowl die each year from lead poisoning. This x-ray shows lead shot shown here in the stomach of a bald eagle. It was consumed along with its prey. Fishing weights and shot remain a major cause of lead poisoning in aquatic and fish-eating birds. Human population growth is another human-based cause of biodiversity loss. Even if per capita consumption patterns remain constant, more people will require more timber harvesting, fishing, farmland, and extraction of fossil fuels and minerals. In the past 40 years, the global population has doubled from about 3.5 billion to about 7 billion. In that time, according to calculations of the World Wide Fund for Nature, our consumption of global resources has grown from 60% of what the Earth can support over the long term to 150%. At the same time, global wildlife populations have declined by more than a third because of expanding agriculture, urbanization, and other human activities. <coughs> Overharvesting involves taking more individuals than reproduction can replace. A classic example is the extermination of the American passenger pigeon, Ectopistes migratorius, even though it inhabited only eastern North America. 200 years ago, this was the world's most abundant bird, with a population of 3 to 5 billion animals. In spite of this vast abundance, market hunting and habitat destruction caused the entire population to crash in only about 20 years, between 1870 and 1890. The last known wild bird was shot in 1900, and the last existing passenger pigeon, a female named Martha, died in 1914 in the Cincinnati Zoo. In this picture, we see a pair of stuffed passenger pigeons. Overharvesting of marine resources is also a significant problem. This figure shows the yield of a bluefin tuna, a commercially important fish species since 1950. Note that the allowable catch, solid red line, is significantly higher than the sustainable catch, dashed red line, but that the actual catch is much higher than either. Fish stocks have been seriously depleted by overharvesting in many parts of the world. A huge increase in fishing fleet size and efficiency in recent years has led to a crash of many oceanic systems. Worldwide, 13 of 17 principal fishing zones are now reported to be commercially exhausted or in steep decline. At least three quarters of all commercial oceanic species are overharvested. Canadian fisheries biologists estimate that only 10% of the top predators, such as swordfish, marlin, tuna, and shark, remain in the Atlantic Ocean. Ground fish, such as cod, flounder, halibut, and hake, also are severely depleted. You can avoid adding to this overharvest by eating only abundant, sustainably harvested varieties. In addition to harvesting wild species for food, we also obtain a variety of valuable commercial products from nature. 
Much of this represents sustainable harvest, but some forms of commercial exploitation are highly destructive and a serious threat to certain rare species. Despite international bans on trade in products from endangered species, smuggling of furs, hides, horns, live specimens, and uh, folk medicines amounts to millions of dollars each year. The profits to be made in wildlife smuggling are enormous. Tiger or leopard fur coats can bring $100,000 in Japan or Europe. The population of African black rhinos dropped from approximately 10, 100,000 in the 1960s to about 3,000 in the 1980s because of demand for their horns. In Asia, where it is prized for its supposed medicinal properties, powdered rhino horn fetches $28,000 per kilogram. The entire species is classified as critically endangered and the western population is officially extinct. Plants are also threatened by overharvesting. Wild ginseng has been nearly eliminated in many areas because of the Asian demand for the roots, which are used as an aphrodisiac and folk medicine. Cactus rustlers steal cacti by the ton from the American Southwest and Mexico. With prices as high as $1,000 for rare specimens, it's not surprising that many are now endangered. Cyanide fishing in coral reefs is a significant problem because of the overharvesting of tropical fishes, but also from the poisoning of the coral, resulting in habitat loss. One thing to note is that overharvesting does not apply to, to the normal harvesting of agricultural crops. These crops are planted specifically to be harvested and thus are not included in our concern for overharvesting of wild flora and fauna. Some animal populations have been greatly reduced or even deliberately exterminated because they are regarded as dangerous to humans or livestock or because they compete with our use of resources. Every year, U.S. government animal control agents trap, poison, or shoot thousands of coyotes, bobcats, prairie dogs, and other species considered threats to people, domestic livestock, or crops. This animal control effort costs about $20 million in federal and state funds each year and kills some 700,000 birds and mammals, about 100,000 of which are coyotes. Defenders of wildlife regard this program as cruel, callous, and mostly ineffective in reducing livestock losses. Protecting flocks and herds with guard dogs or herders or keeping livestock out of areas that are the home range of wild species would be a better solution, they believe. Ranchers, on the other hand, argue that without predator control, western livestock ranching would be impossible. 